Hi everyone. Uh, good evening. Our internet connection is not very good. Uh, so for that, uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am very excited and having the privilege to introduce you to the Dr. Katharina Hobbiter. She is a primatologist and work her research group work for apes communication and the gestures. She used to find the different gestures that chimps use. She spent a lot of her work, a uh, lot of her time in the forest of Uganda at the Odango Research, Research Center. And she will be now presenting her work and research group work on ape gestures and more. That's all. You can start, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me today. It's really a privilege to be able to talk to such a big group of you about the things that I um, have done in my research career and how I've gotten here. I feel like I've been someone for whom a lot of the things have happened by luck or by accident or by serendipity in my research. Um, and I started off as a physicist and I got distracted by questions about our behavior and our biology and that took me down a whole different route of research through my graduate studies and career and has ended up in me spending, um, as you are hearing, more than half my life now running around living in rainforests working with wild apes. Um, so I will introduce you to a little bit of the research that we do in my lab group here. We're based in St. Andrews. Um, and I've left hopefully plenty of time though for questions and discussion. And please do let me know if as I'm talking, there's something you have a question about. I'll try and keep an eye on the questions or I'm very happy to chat about either our research or any aspect of, of my scientific career kind of afterwards too. So. I will share some slides and we'll get going. Uh, Can we start the recording before that? Gaurav? Yeah, we are. This one. Dr. Kat, do we have your permission to record this? Yes, please do. Thank you very much for asking. Can you see my slides okay now? Yes, perfect. You can start. Perfect. Okay. So as I was saying, my, my research group with the Wild Minds Lab, we, we started out, I started out as a chimpanzee researcher and then I moved to working with many different great apes. Um, actually, now we work with elephants, we work with corvids, we're extending our work out to many different kinds of social animals, but, but I'm certainly still very much an ape researcher at heart, and that's mostly what I will speak to you about today. 
Um, I'm based at the University of St. Andrews, but I spend around six or seven months a year in the field. And because most of the apes I work with are African great apes, um, I'm usually in Uganda or now increasingly also in Guinea in West Africa at my new field site. Um, I put this thank you slide up first for two reasons. One is that um, I think a theme through most of what I will talk about today is that a lot of the research that I do and that I'd like to do going forwards is founded on collaboration, is founded on interdisciplinary work. And I want to give you an idea of just a snapshot of the people involved. And often these thank you slides go at the end of talks when we are full of information and it's easy to skip past them. And I just really want to emphasize that everything that I've done, be it the graduate students I work with, the field assistants I work with, the communities that host our research and our research sites around Africa. Um, this is very much a collective effort and a collective research group. And I think that's foundational to, to us being able to do any of the work that I will talk to you about today. Okay, so one of the main questions that is central to a lot of the work I've done is about language and whether or not human language is truly unique. Is it different in some meaningful way from the communication systems other species has? Because language is an incredibly powerful tool. We can articulate any ideas that come into our minds. We can share ideas between individuals in our species. Um, we use it today for anything from scientific talks, but also to poetry, to song, to physics, to putting silly things on Twitter and on the internet. Um, but communication systems, like all other behavior, are adapted in some way to the needs of the species that is using them. And that means that each species has the communication system it needs to achieve the goals that it it needs to do. Now, that's basically the core of the fundamental question in my research. What did humans need to communicate that shaped our communication system into language? And is there anything about that communication system that is different from those that we share with our close relatives, like the other apes, or with more distant but highly social species, like elephants, for example? Okay, so to answer that kind of question, I think we have to understand other species communication. I can't tell you if human language is unique without understanding how other species communicate. And what's more and more interesting to me is that if we understand another animal's system of communication, we can ask lots of other questions afterwards about their minds, about how they think, about how they see the world. So as Tim Bergen said a long time ago, can we ever interview an animal in its own language? Now, I don't mean sitting down uh, in the rainforest with a chimpanzee and a clipboard and gesturing, using chimpanzee gestures to him. What I mean by that is, can I ever be in a position where I can think about the world as if I was a chimpanzee? What does it mean to be a chimpanzee? Can I think about the world through their eyes, which allows me to ask the right kind of scientific questions if I want to compare different systems? Now, apes have amazingly diverse systems of communication. Um, what well, primates do in general, these are just a few of what you would see if you spent some time with chimpanzees. So we have vocalizations that travel a kilometer through the rainforest, um, lots and lots of facial expressions, the bright pink of an estrus swelling to signify that a female is able to get pregnant. But my main field of research has been in gesture, the way in which chimpanzees, other great apes and humans move their bodies in order to communicate particular goals. Now, the reason that I'm very excited about working in gesture is that gesture offers something quite different in some ways. So lots of animal signals are what we call broadcast signals. That means that they are broadcasting information to the world, um, irrespective of who's around to receive it. Now, we give those kind of signals off too. So if you are in the kitchen with me and I pick up a pan on the stove and it's too hot, I would yell and I'd blow on my fingers. And if you're sitting there, you understand 
from the yell that I give and my behavior that the pan was hot. You get information from the behavior I'm broadcasting. But I don't intend to share that with you. I would still yell and I would still do all of that even if there's nobody in the room. What I do with language is very different. I can choose to share information with a specific partner. So for example, I can choose to tell you when you come into the room half an hour later, even though my fingers aren't burning anymore, to watch out the pan is hot. So I can choose when and where to share information to achieve a goal with a specific partner in a back and forth exchange. That's what I do with language. Um, and it really revolutionized our understanding of other species communication. When in the 1980s, researchers like uh, Joseph Cole and Mike Tomasello were able to show that great apes are using their gestures in that goal-directed, language-like way. They're not just broadcasting information, they're communicating to someone. And it allows us to start to ask questions about um, their communication system and how that relates to, to human language in a more meaningful way. It gives us a level playing field on which to compare. There are other animal signals that are used in that goal-directed way, but it tends to be that maybe a species has one signal. And what's truly special about gesture is you'll see apes have 80, 90 different gestures. There's a whole system of communication used in this language-like exchange. Okay, to start to address questions about animal minds and animal communication, though, we have to get over a few hurdles that are present in animal cognitive research. And too often, we take this perspective on animal behavior, right? We put humans at the front of some sort of system of progression, and we ask whether or not there's anything that makes us truly unique or truly different. But I think if we want to understand other species' minds, this is a problem, taking this perspective, because this is not how evolution works. So there we go, that's better, right? This is how evolution works. Every modern species that is out there in the world today has traveled along its own evolutionary trajectory. And each species is no more or less evolved than any other species present. They are just very good at doing the things that they need to, to be a member of that species. So a human being is not more or less evolved than an elephant or a rat or a flower for that matter. And I think if we put it in this perspective, then we can ask questions in the right way. Because otherwise, if we're taking that anthropocentric perspective, putting humans in the center always, what we do is ask, can other animals do what we do? But then we miss the opportunity to ask about extraordinary capacities that they have and that we don't. We'll never know about them unless we start also to think about what it means to be a chimpanzee, a howler monkey, a gibbon. We have to start to take that species-centric perspective for the questions we want to explore. Okay, lots of researchers who work on animal minds do so in captivity, and there are very good reasons for doing so. You can get beautiful, clear observations. You are certain, hopefully, of where your animals are most days, and so you can find them, you can track them the whole day. If you're working out in a rainforest, as I do, then it becomes suddenly very difficult to find your study species, and there are all sorts of fun extras that get in the way on a daily basis. But the reason that I work in a rainforest is because I'm a fairly old school ethologist at heart. So while in captivity, I could ask questions about a chimpanzee's potential. What could they do under extraordinary circumstances? To ask an evolutionary question about how they're adapted, I need to ask that question in the environment to which they're adapted. So that means going out to work with wild chimpanzees, wild gorillas, wild bonobos, in order to ask questions about African ape communication. And it takes a long time. I have spent a lot of my life running around rainforests, and it is a slow, slow process. But I think it's one that's really important. Because who you communicate to matters. And 
If I'm in captivity, groups of chimpanzees, for example, are small, 10 or 12 individuals, whereas in the wild, the groups I work with have 100, 120 individuals. They have grandfathers and new babies, cousins, aunties, uncles. In captivity, what you communicate for is also different because they have a lot of time that they can spend playing, their food is provided, they don't have to go and find it. Um, in the wild, chimpanzees will go and hunt for monkeys, which I think is frowned in a zoo. They're not allowed to go next door to the cage to go get their lunch. Um, they will take girls away on consortship. There's the full expression of their behavior in the wild. So what they're communicating about is also very different. And finally, why they're communicating is different. In captivity, they spend every day together. And so they really know what has gone on day to day. In the wild, a chimpanzee might not see somebody else in their group for days or weeks or months, and they need to find out what has happened. So when we're thinking about communication, the who, the what for, and the why are all important parts of communication. And they are very different in a captive context and a wild one. And it's why it's been so important to me to go and do this research with wild ape communities. Okay, what does an ape gesture look like? Hopefully this plays for you. You've got Zephyr down at the bottom of the screen. He's an adult male. And he wants Rohara, the female, to come down towards him so that he can groom her. And he gives a branch shake and a big loud scratch. And then he waits for a response. Because remember, this isn't broadcast. He's communicating to her and she was not very impressed. So he has to repeat his communication, shake, scratch. And this time he elaborates and adds an arm raise. So that combination of gestures seems to have worked. And again, this is much more language like broadcast communication is just about putting it out there. So it's as if in the morning over breakfast, if I want coffee, I'm just saying coffee, 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 coffee all the time. Whereas actually, hopefully, if I was being polite, I would say, please, could you pass me the coffee? and then wait for your answer because I'm communicating to you. Maybe if you don't give me the coffee, I would elaborate. So like Zephyr did, I would ask again, or I would ask in a different way. But that back and forth exchange between individuals, between partners in the communication is another really good indication that we're dealing with a system that looks more like the way in which we use language than many other animal signals do. Okay, so the first thing that we tend to do when we're investigating a system of communication is ask what the signals are. And the signal repertoires for gestures, as I was saying, it's really rich. You have over 80 different types in one species, but many of those gestures are shared across species. So um, there are 40 of the gestures that all great apes have in common. There's another 36 or so that all the African apes have in common, and then a few that specific species use. Now, this is just the start. Even though we've been doing this now for over 20 years, we still have gaps on the map that we need to fill in. And you know, looking at rare contexts that don't happen very often, we're still working on filling this in, but we are seeing a quite clear picture emerge, which is that this system is probably biologically inherited because the closer you are as a species, the more gestures you have in common. So chimpanzees and bonobos that diverged only about 1 million years ago, they overlap maybe 98% of their gestural repertoire. Whereas chimpanzees and orangutans who diverged eight or 9 million years ago or more, they share fewer of their gestures in common. Okay, so once you've got the repertoire, once we know what the gesture types are, we can start to ask things about how they're used. And one of the first questions we ask is, what does it mean? Now, even though that's a very intuitive question to ask, it's actually a very difficult one to ask. So I think hopefully everybody listening here today can think of an example where they meant to say something and somebody else misunderstood, even when we're communicating in the same language with somebody we know we can make mistakes because we misinterpret what they mean. Words are flexible, words are ambiguous. I can use the same word and it can have different meanings depending on what I'm communicating about. So doing this in a different language, 
um, let alone in a different species, becomes a really complex puzzle, working out what someone means to say with the words or the gestures that they're using. Okay, well, one way to do this is to look at context. And that was a really common way in animal behavior research. So these are the gestures used in feeding. These are the gestures used in traveling. These are the gestures used in play. And we can describe that. We can see their feeding and their playing. It's observable. We're not trying to mind read what's going on. But the problem with context is that it's not quite the solution to this problem because I can mean different things in the same context and I can mean the same thing in different contexts. So if, for example, I have a gesture that means come here, I can say that when we're feeding and I can say that when we're traveling. And if all I record is the context, we don't understand that the gesture has the same meaning. So a single gesture that means no, go away, come here, can be used across contexts, but with only one meaning. So how do we get to this understanding of what another animal, another ape, say a chimpanzee, means when she uses a gesture? How do we do that without mind reading? Because we can't do that as scientists. Well, what we do is we record the behavior that stops the signaler from signaling. Now, it's not perfect. Um, there will always be mistakes in a system. But if we go back to that coffee example or looking at Zephyr when he was gesturing to Rahara, the thing that stops me asking you for coffee in the morning is when you pass me the coffee. The thing that stopped R Zephyr from gesturing to Rahara was when she came down and was groomed. So we can get an idea of what goal the signaler had by looking at what behavioral change in the recipient stops the signaler from signaling anymore. And if we have some mistakes that will happen, but if we have hundreds and thousands of cases and those mistakes are few, we can still see a clear pattern in the data. So here we've got one gesture type slap object and lots of different possible goals that a chimpanzee could have. And we see it being used by one chimp and then others and others. And we see a pattern emerging which is that no matter who is using it or who they're using it to, gestures have a common agreed meaning between these different chimps. Now, in this case, this gesture has two meanings, and that is like also like human language. Many animal signals are very specific, but actually there's flexibility in gesture. So just as the word bark could mean dog bark or tree bark, and context helps you disambiguate, we see the same thing with gestures. And it's, they can have one, two, even three meanings that are then disambiguated by things like context. Okay. Okay. So what can we do with these kind of systems? And as I was saying, I think this is the kind of classic studies that have been done in gesture up until now. But we have to start thinking about taking that chimpanzee or gorilla or whatever species we're studying, thinking about putting them at the center of the questions that we're asking. And I'll show you just a couple of quick ways that we've tried to do that in my research group over the years. OK, so taking the pan-centric perspective. So here, pan for pantroglodytes or pan paniscus, chimps and bonobos. Um, when we are looking at gestural repertoires, most gesture researchers look at all the different ways apes move their body, and then they decide whether or not this is the same gesture as this, or maybe this is the same gesture as this, or if they're actually two different gestures. And we just do that subjectively in advance. We as humans are deciding whether or not this and this is the same signal. That's how repertoires are constructed across most animal communication studies. It's true in many different kind of contexts and ways. But it's not really ideal because what if from a chimpanzee's perspective, this and this are different gestures or this and this are actually the same gesture? It means it's going to be very difficult to parse out their communication if we don't have the right units of communication. Now, it might seem a bit silly to be worrying about this after working on gesture for 10 or 15 years, but it's only now that we've had the data sets to be able to ask this important question. I mean, imagine trying to understand a language where you don't know if a change in tone 
represents a change in emphasis, which it would do in English or German, um, or a change in tone on the same word changes the meaning of the word as it does in Thai or Vietnamese. So is like a shift in hand position the equivalent of tone in chimpanzee gesture? Well, we don't have to guess anymore. So what I can do is use these very large repertoires of uh, data sets of gestures that we have been collecting to be able to try and answer this question. What we did was split down the repertoire into its component parts. So when we describe a gesture, we think about movements, we think about body part, we think about if an object is involved. And then we, we split our data and we asked, does the chimpanzee's behavioral responses, do the meanings in the gestures suggest that the chimpanzees are treating these two actions as one gesture or as separate gestures? So for example, if you are going to shake something, if you shake your arm or you shake your hand, most gesture researchers would have lumped that into the same gesture type. But actually for the chimps, it has a different pattern of meaning. On the other hand, if you use a hit action and you do it with your <coughs> fingers, <coughs> excuse me, with your hand or with your fist, it has a very similar pattern of meanings. So we can choose now to split and lump on the basis of this data. And it turns out that some things um, are really important. Uh, some variables matter when we're, from the chimpanzee's perspective, if you're splitting, some variables matter some of the time, but not all of the time. And some gesture, some variables really don't matter at all. Um, and so we are now able to split and lump all of those movements into a repertoire of gesture types that makes sense from the perspective of the chimps using them. That allows us to ask questions about syntax, about language use, about gestural communication use, that keep in mind the chimp-centric perspective we need to be able to do that appropriately. Okay, the second little example that I will run through quickly is a case of pointing. It's one of those classic gestures, right? Um, and it's something that has long been argued to be uniquely human. Um, it emerges spontaneously and quickly very early on. So young infants, young human infants point for things very early on. Um, and as some of you might know, actually captive apes also spontaneously without training point early on. Now it's important that pointing forms are quite variable cross-culturally um, in humans. So uh, in um, Scotland, for example, we would typically have a pointing form with the index finger, but there are lots of different pointing forms around the world. You can point with your whole hand, you can point with your lips, um, which happens in the Ugandan field site that I work in quite a lot. And so there's variation in the ways you point. The key to pointing is that you are directing somebody else's attention to a third object or subject that you want them to, in some way, do something with. Now, in human infants and in captive apes, it emerges quickly and spontaneously. And so it seems to be a capacity we share. And yet for decades now of study in the wild, 50, 60 years of work with chimpanzees, for example, there's been almost no reports of pointing. So is this something that is truly a human specific capacity and the captive apes are just perhaps learning it from living in the human world? Or is this something that's also an ape cap capacity, but that the wild apes are not using because they don't need to for some reason? Now, David Levens, who is a professor down in Sussex, had a hypothesis that the reason that pointing emerges in humans and captive apes <clears throat> is because captive apes experience barriers to access. They live in cages and there are things they want to get that they can't reach. <clears throat> Young infants, human infants, are pretty useless when they're born. So a, an infant chimpanzee can climb a tree, but an infant human, you know, it takes us a year or more sometimes even just to walk. So we have barriers to accessing things we want because we're not very um, well developed in our early infancy. The other thing that they both have in common is a helpful other. And so um, both in the case of captive apes and young infants, there are other people around in the environment who are willing to help them get things. 
And that means it's worth them pointing because if they point, there's a good chance that the helpful other will reciprocate and give them the thing they're pointing at, for example. Now, under these conditions, pointing is a sensible and useful strategy. But in the wild, there are no physical barriers. So as I was saying, young apes are extremely adept climbers. Even at just a couple of months old, they can just climb or move or walk over and get the food that they want. And so perhaps there's no pointing needed. But again, what we need to do is think about how apes are using their communication. Because in the wild, they don't have physical barriers. But one thing that a chimpanzee would certainly have is what I would describe as a social barrier. So there are strong hierarchies, there are ranks, there are um, roles within the community in a community of wild chimpanzees, just as there are in communities of humans. And one of the things that is um, important to keep in mind is that a young chimpanzee, if you have a large dominant alpha male, a large big male chimpanzee who's sitting there, it's not like a very young chimpanzee can just walk up and take the food. There is a social barrier to them being able to approach and be able to get what they want. So if those individuals are blocking, the question is, are there also helpful individuals and here, for example, perhaps their mother, um, chimpanzees have a long dependency period. They are with their mother often until they're nine or 10 years old. They might have older siblings who are a bit bigger and stronger. So they do have potential barriers, except for those barriers are social, and they have potentially helpful others. And the question is whether or not under these circumstances that apes would then start to point. Now, it turns out that this set of circumstances is actually really, generally speaking, the food that chimpanzees have access to is not monopolizable. It's not one thing. It's distributed around, for example, in a big fig tree. So if you've got a social barrier with an individual here, you could just choose to go to the branch over there. It's rare that you get monopolizable food. So these kind of sets of circumstances do not happen very often in the wild. But when we narrowed it down, we started to see a few possible cases. And to give you one example of how this might work, I was lucky enough to visit the Bosu community of chimpanzees in Guinea a few years ago, who crack nuts with hammers um, and anvil stones. They take two stones and they put the hard nut on and they crack the nut open to get to the soft meat. <coughs> now stones are a rare resource. And because those stones are limited, Bosu chimpanzees, especially young ones, regularly experience situations in which they can't access something that they want to. Now, this is a community for whom it is a sensible, pointing would be a sensible strategy. And actually very early on, we're still in the early stages of it, but very early on when we started to look at the Bosu community of chimpanzees, we saw many more cases of possible use of pointing, and in chimpanzees it's with the whole hand, than we saw in the other communities we've looked at. So again, this was a really good lesson in thinking about things from the chimpanzee perspective. So not a physical barrier, but a social one. And then taking into account the specific socio-ecological circumstances of the individuals who are communicating. Because if they don't need to communicate about something, then why should they? Of course, you're going to see absences. The question is, why is it absent? Can't they or just don't they? OK, so when we start to think about a species communication from the species own perspective, I think we can ask more meaningful questions about whether behaviors are present or absent when we're taking this into account. We can't just test one individual if we want to know what a species has done, but we also just can't test one population or even one generation. We need to think about where they are communicating, about what they might be communicating about, and about who they're communicating to. And this is what we're trying to do in a new project that we have here in St. Andrews. And we're working with research groups and labs around the world. And what we're trying to do is improve on this early picture. This was our data at the beginning of the project. And what you can see here is that most species just have a single dot. 
it was you know one group perhaps just a few individuals in that group that we had data from now hopefully by the end of the project we're going to have this picture where we're able to have multiple groups multiple individuals living in different circumstances solving different problems and really kind of tackling the question of what is present in ape communication in a way that puts it on a level playing field with the way that we explore things in human language. I mean, we know, for example, that we could not describe the whole of human language by just studying language as it's expressed in St. Andrews or in Kolkata. We would need to go around the world to lots of different locations. And we need to do the same thing with the animal species that we're studying. We need to look at a diverse enough set of individuals and groups and challenges to properly describe what's going on in their communication, in their cognition, in their, in their behavioral expression in many ways. And this, just to sum up, is really sort of what, why I think this large scale interdisciplinary approach is the way forward. Because it's only by doing this that we can explore the questions that are at the intersection of biology, of ecology and behavior, that we can really start to tackle the interesting questions about what's going on in animal minds. Otherwise, we're going to end up with so many false positives and negatives. We have to put the big picture together. It's not just about getting more data because more data gives us the opportunity to conduct more sophisticated analyses. There are some questions you can only ask when all of the pieces of the puzzle come together. And it allows us to get into things with much more nuance. So for example, we can start to ask about intergenerational differences. One of our data sets has 30 years of video and I can look at whether or not there are changes in communication across generations. We can look at how life history variables interact with species differences. We can start to ask questions that pull apart gene expression. So this is an East and West African chimpanzee at the bottom and a bonobo at the top and East and West African chimpanzees are much more closely related to, the, to each other than they are to bonobos. But actually, when you look at the behavioral expression, West African chimpanzees and bonobos are remarkably similar, and it's East African chimps that are the outlier. And we need all of those data points filled in to be able to tease apart these patterns. If it's about tool use, is it about solving a complex problem, in which case you don't need tools, maybe you'll do tool use that's driving a type of communication or cognition, then what about non-ape monkeys? And while we're at it, what about non-primates at all? Can we see commonalities about tool users irrespective of the species or taxa that they happen to be in? So to answer those kind of questions, what is key is that we're always going to need more than one researcher, probably more than one research group's lifetime of data. So it's only by collaborating across groups, by making our methods and our data sets open access, that we're going to be able to ask, I think, the next big step in the kind of questions that we want to ask about animal minds. So just again, to say a big thank you to um, a small set at this point of the people who've been involved in some of the projects that I just presented. And to say, please do come and check out our websites. We have a GitHub page where we host our code and our data. Um, and please do get in touch if you have any questions or you'd like to reach out about anything. So I'm gonna stop sharing there and just um, give you guys the opportunity to ask any questions that you have or anything that you'd like to know at the moment. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat box, actually. Oh. Yes, sorry. I realized that I couldn't see the chat box while I was presenting. So let me just work through them. Um, how to narrow it to, how to narrow down the point in which Humans are inferring a behavior and not mixing it with the animal's real behavior. That's a real problem, right? We think of science as objective, right? We want to be objective, we want to be scientific, and we tend to forget that scientists are humans. The minute you put a human person in the mix, you are going to have a subjective interpretation. 
the questions I ask are a reflection of the cultures I grew up in, of my way of thinking, of the way that I was trained scientifically. All of that is shapes the science that I do in ways that are subtle but are really there. So I don't think you can completely take it out, the, the human element. I think what we have to be is transparent about it and we have to be explicit in our thinking. So when we're in a situation and we're measuring animal behavior, we need to ask, why are we measuring it this way? What is it about my perspective and my training that might be limiting my thinking? Are there other perspectives and other methods that might be more suitable so that we can be transparent about what impact that has on the findings that we have. Um, Tree asks, from the way I describe gestures and their meaning, do their meanings evolve or change over time? For example, the word thou is not common in the lexicon of English anymore, and with time it's dropped off. So does something like that happen for gestures in chimpanzees? It's a great question. Um, it is too early for us to say at the moment. These kind of things tend to take time. And we're only just, I think, now at the t getting to the point where we're describing the full repertoire of gestures. But the data set that I mentioned from BOSU that has that 30, 40 year data set that we are coding, um, it will take us a few more years to work through it. But it might be one of the cases where we could start to answer this question because we could look at whether or not the way in which a gesture was used 40 years ago by the same chimpanzee group living in the same place with the same genetic line is used in the same way today. So please come back and ask me that question in a couple of years. Um, how does the gestural communication sync in with facial expression? Is there a preferred mode? So gesture certainly is combined with facial expression, with vocalizations, with lots. All of these signals are multimodal. They are combined in a single unit. And it's a little bit artificial of us to pull gesture out or to pull facial expression out or vocalization out. But at the same time, I have tried in the past, relatively recently, to do full communication studies where we're really encompassing every aspect of signaling and it is really challenging because essentially we already need I mean our database of gestures is 16,000 cases and big enough to answer the questions we need of gesture alone yet so I think you can start to put the pieces together on specific instances so for example we're looking at when you use one gesture type with or without a facial expression, with or without a vocalization, how does it shape the communication? But we don't yet have the kind of data sets to put the whole picture together. Preliminarily, yes. Um, vocalizations can, for example, help to um, some of the gestural meanings that are ambiguous. Like object shake typically means move yourself. And depending on the vocalization that goes with it, it can mean come here or go away. So there's some evidence that it will be important, but we do need more data, I think. Um, the sex of the individual also plays a major role in the way they communicate. And is there a possibility to combine both, uh, to combine both or minimize the error rising due to individuality and human perception? Yes, and it's certainly true in, in all of the <clears throat> great ape species that um, you get sex differences in behavior. They are different for different individuals, different in different groups. So, you know, in chimpanzees, males tend to are dominant over females, really but confusing. I've known particular female chimps who have taken absolutely no nonsense from the adult males in the group. We have one female, Nambi, who is 56 years old, um, and she is the matriarch of the group in a meaningful way. Technically, the males are dominant, but nobody messes with Nambi. So the way in which um, sex differences express themselves in behavior and communication are, are real, but are also subtle and overlapping. It's not like males and females. You get a lot of overlap between those, just as you do in human behavior as well. Um, are these gestures spontaneous? So they develop in an individual without a community of chimps, or are they developed and learned? That's a really good question. And I think the answer is both yes and no. So we uh, humans also have a biologically determined system of um, spoken sounds, at least. So there's the phoneme sounds that we make 
are available to all of us at birth. And it doesn't matter if you were born in Scotland or born in Thailand, you would have access to the same set of phonemes at birth. But over time, the language that we use day to day and that we're exposed to narrows down the set that we're using and tunes it. So eventually over 10 or 15 years, you end up with a slightly different set. There's some overlap, but there are some differences depending on the language and language groups that you grow up with. And that's one of the reasons why learning some languages as adults, if they're very new to us, is really difficult. So. I'm lucky I grew up speaking quite a few different languages. Um, so I grew up in the Middle East and then in Europe um, and then moved around a lot of Africa. But um, I didn't spend any time um, until I was an adult, at least in um, places with tonal languages. So things like Mandarin, Thai, Vietnamese. Um, and I find it very difficult to discriminate the tones because I hadn't been exposed to them. But if I had been at birth, I would be. And it's really the same with the chimp gestures, we think. So the available repertoire is there and all chimps have the potential to use any of that set of 80 or 90 gestures. But the ones they actually go on to use, that might be shaped by their experiences with individuals over time. Um, Saumia asks, how, uh, how important is learning a language in ape communities? Are all the gestures inherent or are they taught and learnt as well? So that overlaps a little bit with what we were just talking about. Um, but the gestures, just because a gesture is inherent, is biologically determined, you know, all chimpanzees have the option to produce an arm raised gesture, doesn't mean that it's not intentional and flexible. So as I was saying, all of spoken language, human spoken language, is founded on a biologically determined set of sounds, but we choose to combine them in different ways and to use them in different ways, intentionally in a goal-directed way in spoken language. And so there's just because something is biologically inherent doesn't mean that it is fixed and reflexive and um, uh, yeah, in, not flexible in that way. Padmanav asks, is it known if great apes can communicate between species? Um, a really good question again. Um, the answer is not yet. Um, so most apes in the wild, there's very little species overlap in their range. There's a little chimpanzee gorilla overlap. There's no chimpanzee bonobo overlap. There's no lowland mountain gorilla overlap. So in many cases, we haven't had the opportunity to see what would happen. Probably yes. So Kirsty Graham, who is a postdoctoral fellow in my research group, worked on bonobo communication and I worked on chimp communication. When we put our data sets together, not only were the gestures the same, but often the meanings for which the gestures were used were very similar. So hypothetically, they have the same platform available to them, but nobody's done, I mean, it wouldn't be ethical in the wild and nobody in captivity has looked at whether or not that exchange can happen. Um, Rakesh asks, are these communication signals multimodal? For example, gestures with vocalization. So yes, as I was saying, they are. Also, gesture is fundamentally multimodal because you can have a silent gesture and you can have an audible gesture. So gesture as a system is also a multimodal system, which is one of the reasons it's so lovely and flexible. How does rapport establishment work when approaching a group and establishing yourself in the field? Uh, slowly is the easy answer there. Um, so when I am first meeting a group of wild chimpanzees, realistically for me to really feel that they are comfortable with me and I can collect good data, it can be up to 10 years um, before they will, so from being truly wild um, to, to being completely habituated and I can move around the forest and film them comfortably. Now, part of the reason for that is of course, um, most of these apes are, you know, African forests are not some kind of pristine wilderness. Human, there, there are human communities that have lived there and lived alongside these apes for many generations. And so there are sometimes cases where there's been um, human wildlife challenges. And that means that apes start from a position of suspicion. They, they don't trust necessarily somebody coming in because usually it's competition for resources, competition for food. Um, chimpanzees generally are just highly suspicious. Uh, they, chimpanzee groups will tend to fight with each other. They're very territorial. And so a stranger typically means danger. And so that is something that I think makes chimpanzee habituation very slow. 
if we compare it with gorillas and bonobos, where strangers are often a point of interest or some, you know, a nice opportunity to interact with somebody new, their habituation goes much quick, more quickly. It can be just a couple of years and you can make a lot of progress. So it takes time and I do it the slow way. So in the old school way, people would put food out, they would provision with bananas or sugar cane to allow the apes to come and then study them there. But that also creates all sorts of one possible conflict in the future. And more importantly, is going to shape and change their behavior and their relationship. I basically want them to ignore me. And so I just do it the slow way. I go and find them in the morning. If they run away from me, I let them go. I never chase chimps. And maybe in the afternoon, I try and find them again. And I say hello and quietly sit down somewhere, maybe 100 meters away and see what they do. And over the months and over the years, they'll slowly get to the point that I can just walk around the forest with them. It's a real privilege that sense, the first kind of time that some of the apes really let you in that way is, is just a wonderful feeling. It's really nice, especially when it takes so long. OK, so um, I've got a little message there that says, yes, because I'm actually teaching a class in about five or 10 minutes here. And so um, I'm going to finish off there. But please do reach out to me with questions if you have any. And it was really lovely getting to chat to you and answer some of the questions that you had today. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you, ma'am, for answering those questions. Just a little question which I had was, like uh, you used to go in wild forest and all, and in one of the Nat Geo paper I was reading, you were once observing the wild chimp, and then suddenly you look back, there was a cobra snake sitting, and then there will be also bugs and insects. How do you deal with all these things? <laughs> Um, I mean, the bugs and the insects, I don't mind too much. Although one of my new field sites has um, sweat bees and they just cover you and they tickle and you have to, you know, be quite quiet and quite still and it's very difficult. So patience there. Um, I mean, at the, the cobra was a very close interaction and I certainly, I froze. Basically, I was sat down and I heard a noise behind me and when I turned around, then there was one of the big black forest cobras who kind of came up. And luckily I just froze and then she just went her way. And I have, I guess, learned over a lot of years that typically if I just do nothing, if I just stay as calm as I can be, then almost always it will be fine. Most of the time, most of the species I work with are, are going to be more afraid of me than I am of them. But it is difficult to remember that when my heart was like thumping for a long time afterwards, but you somehow have to stay calm on the outside and keep your excitement on the inside. It's the same with the chimps. If you get really excited when you see them do something really interesting, they don't know why we're excited. And so that worries them, it stresses them. So even when something really exciting happens, I have to be re really quiet on the outside. I have to sort of look like I couldn't care less, even if on the inside I'm excited and jumping up and down for joy. So that ability to sort of keep a, keep a calm, quiet outer is definitely a useful one in field primatology. Thank you. And also those gestures which uh, we find in chimpanzees, can we human mimic those gestures to like attract a female or like to call a male or something? Can we use mimicry to? I mean, we can certainly make all of the gestures and some of the gestures are the kind of things that we do to each other. So they will reach out a hand like this to ask for something. They'll say, come here or go away. But I don't use them with the chimps and I wouldn't recommend anybody does because at the moment we're still working out what they mean. So it's a little bit like, you know, you go into a new country, you're learning their language, but also their culture and how to express it. And I have made many mistakes moving and living in many countries this way. And you don't want to make mistakes with the chimps that you are working with. So yeah, we definitely don't interact and don't intervene, but Theoretically, in the future, uh, there is a chimpanzee called Ai who was raised by humans and lives in um, Japan at the Kyoto University Primate Institute. And so when I met Ai for the first time, because she was a captive chimp who was raised by humans, I greeted her chimp style, which I know how to give the greeting. And it was very, very nice for me. It's the first time I could express it this way. So potentially, yes, but just never with wild chimps, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe just one last question, and also it's an important question because I was reading that uh, even the Jane Goodall's work that about the chimps that got criticizes because of the feeding station that says that in the last there was a lot of fight because of feeding stations and all. And also if there is no feeding station, there is maybe not much observation which one can record. 
so where is mm -hmm. that boundary which you create the uh, observing the chimps in wild and their true nature and then having a laboratory set up and observing them mm -hmm. so i mean i think it certainly takes time in the wild i think the costs of putting feeding stations we didn't know then. Uh, I mean, we, you know, we didn't understand properly Jane Goodall. So the chimps there ended up fighting over the food. Even chimps will kill each other at times. So there are things that were done. It was also at other sites like Mahale, one of the Japanese sites that started at the same time as Jane Goodall's site, Gombe, um, also used provisioning with food. And it, it's not to critique them because at the time we didn't know. But now we know, we know that we should not do that. But it does then mean, so for example, I started this year a new chimpanzee field site in Guinea in West Africa. And I know that it will take me five years maybe before we have our first observations. And that's really challenging as a scientist because getting the funding usually depends on producing research, on producing papers. And so when it's so slow at the beginning, it can be really difficult. But I think for both scientific reasons and for ethical reasons, we we have to make some distinctions anymore. And it's just not worth it to, uh, we have a responsibility to the apes that we work with in the wild. When I leave um, and I retire, it's not as if the apes just magically go back to being wild. My work with them has changed their behavior. And so I think we have to keep that in mind. And it means we have a responsibility to the apes and to the communities, the human communities who live nearby as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you very much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Take care. Bye. Thank you, all the audience who have joined.